Oftentimes, an artist's biggest challenge is putting words to an image or piece. It can be seen as a challenge because we are being tasked with describing the very thing that only our vision could capture. Yet still, we are tasked. We can choose from words that have a sort of tangibility to them, verbs like jump, run, or sit. Then there are words like perspective. Words like this mean nothing without first an idea. Similarly, the photographs I'll be talking about today, specifically abstract photographs, walk in cohesion with perspective and are yielded from a series of ideas. I was 11 years old when I realized that I could make a photograph. I took this seemingly normal family photo of my sister running along the beach. I looked at the print later. The waves are stark white, completely blown out. Her form is silhouetted and water crashes at her ankles. I looked at this and thought of what I'd actually seen and the epiphany of making, rather than taking an image, planted a seed that only grew. Now I look at this image and I think of the abstract, or not so abstract, photographer Hiroshi Sugimoto. In this image here of the sea, it feels meaningful and purposeful, yet by formal conventions of photography, contains little to be pinpointed in terms of detail or subject matter. By the time I entered college, I was interested in doing a series that broke formal conventions and explored a tension of design elements. I was looking at philosophers like Walter Benjamin. He talked about an era of mechanical reproduction. And within this philosophy, there was an entire shift in society's perception that affected their very existence. Now, in his case, he talked about originality. However, today, in this century, I think that we've entered a new era one of technological time, where society's perception and their existence is affected by two main things, the evolution of technology and the ever-ticking clock. Especially for photographers in this global digital world, where technology and time def definitely operate as the lords of our production. In more recent years, photography has become an even more accessible medium, simply through the use of cell phones and devices. It's also a medium that has branches into the communication world, simply due to the ease of pressing a button and having it sent off for publication in digital form. Social media websites like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, etc., have contributed to the idea of what an image is and the abundance of images that photographers have to grapple with. Although I think that it's fair to say that information is one of a flash, but not necessarily one of insight. The process of technological time is reinscribing a prejudice that a photograph should bring us accessible and easily interpreted information, like this image here of my dog. Everyone say aw. Aww. Aww. <laughs> Herein lies a main idea that spurred on my series called Possible Perspectives, a, a series of abstract photographs. I wanted the viewer to remove themselves from all of those connections and instead engage with that image face to face. I want them to be in an unmediated moment. And lastly, I want them to really think about what they're actually seeing. Which brings us to the science of our vision in general. Did you know that when you look at the world, a portion of what you already see is actually a hallucination? What happens is our retinal neurons begin their journey to our brain. They gather at the back of our eye at what's called the optic disc. Now, within this region, we have a blind spot. However, when we look at the world, we do not see a big black blob in the middle of our vision, thankfully. Our brain reads the information 360 degrees around that space and fills it in with a calculated guess or hallucination of what should be there. Now, taking this idea and looking at an image like this that has no identifiable subject matter, ideally then, abstraction will ask the brain to access information that could lead to a new perspective, making abstraction a catalyst for seeing the photograph function differently. Now, I was thinking about making rather than taking a photograph. I was thinking about the global, technical, digital world we live in, and certainly how our vision pr processes information in general. But I have to give credit to this particular series from a simple bout of frustration. I was outside trying to photograph a leaf. I had set up the shot 
It was perfect. Um, and every time I went to take the image, the wind would blow and knock it out of focus. I became really frustrated and I said, fine, family friendly, fine. If you want a blurry photograph, I'll take a blurry photograph. I probably took 100 or so images that evening that were blurry and I didn't look at them for a few weeks. But when I did, I paused. I thought they were curious. One, to me, they were beautiful. And two, I thought that they asked a question about what a photograph could be. Which brings me to Uta Barth. Uta Barth is a photographer and professor at the University of California in Riverside. Now, in Barth's images, she does blur all of the surrounding background. She usually leaves some sort of object to orient the viewer, in this case, the red pole. By doing this, she's instead questioning how space is read within the photograph. In an excerpt written on her work by Timothy Martin, he says, the unoccupied focal point is perhaps more ambiguous than the basic schema the series would suggest. If the photographic subject has in effect, if not in fact, been removed from that focal point as expressly proposed, it follows that the point is somewhere within the pictorial space of the image. What he's saying about her work is that by removing that obviously identifiable subject matter or focal point, she is instead asking the viewer to find an entirely new point to the photograph. Whether that's simply how each element blurs into one another or an entirely psychological experience. Which brings me to John Brill. John Brill is a self-taught photographer. He was recently featured at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. This is an image from his series called Bad Memory, where he says psychology plays an essential role in how the viewer interacts with the image due to the lack of information. He also says these images are magical because of their ability to manipulate time and space. Now that's an essential concept for understanding any kind of abstraction, especially in photography. Because any time our fundamental assumptions about time or space are altered, we must occupy a less comfortable place in our mind. One that asks for new conceptual approaches and possibly new perspectives as well. Now, don't get me wrong. I know all photographers work in a field of manipulation. But only some have an intended destination that is psychological rather than rational, observable, or discernible. Now, for some of you, you may be thinking, well, it's still just a blurry photograph, so <laughs> super cool. Um, and it might leave you a little bit confused, which is fine. So take heed, because as an artist, I rather like this response from the viewer. Because if confusion is the reaction, I think that there is potential for something to be found out. There is potential for impact. It's about that journey of experience from disorientation to contemplation to a possible way of perceiving that provide the impact and meaning of abstract photographs. Thank you. <laughs>